In this video, I want to go over some of the material properties of structural steel and how we account for them in design. Uh, what we won't be doing in this video is we're not going to go over the production of steel or its manufacture, as there's other resources for that. And the video series which we have here is really focused on uh, structural design and, you know, so we, we care less about how the material is produced, but really uh, what are the specific aspects of it which we have to account for when we're designing it so that we can have a safe and efficient design. So the first thing that I want to look at is just the basic stress strain behavior of the material. Now this will be a common image for many of you, uh, but I figured it's worth going over it anyways and talking through a few of the specifics which uh, relate to structural steel design. So this is our idealized stress strain curve where we have strain which is our uh, elongation uh, on the x-axis or the horizontal axis and the vertical axis is our stress so that's our force over area and this is for uh, a uniaxial tension test so you can imagine the uh, gray block which we have there as a piece of steel and we're pulling on it in tension so as we uh, continue to pull on it we will pull all the way up to some yield point and at that yield point, we will be at our yield strain, uh, which is just this uh, L sub y over the original length. And we'll be at our yield stress, f of y. And it's this f of y uh, that we use in, in most of our design for structural steel. And that will vary uh, with, between grades to grades, as well as thickness, as we'll see uh, shortly thereafter. Um, the reason we use this f of y in our design is that's our limit state for uh, much of our design purposes where uh, we're going to be either at a serviceability limit state where we don't want our material to have yielded at all and that means that if we're loading uh, below this and we keep our stresses in the material below FY uh, it'll spring right back up and that's what we want for our day-to-day -day serviceability loads so this is you know the general use of a building of its occupants people walking around if it's a parking garage you know vehicles driving on it this isn't for these extreme events where uh, we're really loading it up uh, with large capacities uh, you know, large loads like we would for um, you know a heavy windstorm or hurricane or uh, for example a, a seismic load um, it is those larger loads in which we look at the plastic design uh, and the plastic section capacity of the element. And in fact, that's where uh, a lot of our design will come around. And this is where uh, we've uh, essentially gone through and we've hit the yield stress over the entire depth of the structural steel section. Um, one of the benefits of structural steel is that it has this uh, heavily defined yield plateau. And so even though we are continuing to stretch and deform the material, we're actually not increasing the force uh, pass yield at all. And this we can take advantage of particularly in uh, seismic design in which we will use the yielding of one component as effectively as a structural fuse to protect other portions of the structure by limiting the amount of force which can be entered into there. Um, if we continue to stretch this piece of steel, we'll go all the way up to some ultimate stress. And this ultimate stress is particularly going to get used when we're doing tension design. Um, so we will see in a later video where uh, we will design sort of the gross section uh, for yield and the net section for rupture. And this rupture will use this ultimate stress. Um, and that's the, the highest capacity that it has. And then finally, if we keep pulling and pulling on this material, uh, it'll eventually break and rupture into two pieces. And this is at our ultimate tensile strain. Now, an important thing to note is that uh, while we design sort of down sort of towards the yield strain or maybe before we get to this uh, strain hardening, so the um, epsilon ST, uh, we tend to have a lot of additional strain. And so think of strain as additional deformation capacity out of structural steel. And I'll show you that in some uh, actual stress strain behavior uh, plots in the uh, coming slide. So here we have um, a few different steel types which are common within New Zealand. Uh, probably the most common, which we'll look at in this video series because it's used in structural steel sections. So I sections, which are the universal beams, UBs, and universal columns, UCs, uh, as well as, you know, angles both equal and unequal, 
and uh, you know hollow sections. Um, there's also 480 and 700 quenched and tempered. Uh, one thing to note, so I have circled here where the yield point of these uh, materials are. Um, and you're just going to have you know, essentially the same stiffness, uh, so it's the same modular elasticity, and that's because iron is the dominant component within steel, and so uh, even though you have different alloys, that stiffness isn't going to change significantly. But then also look at where we're starting with our yield stress to then when we bring in our, um, you know, where we have our strain hardening. So this plastic region, there's a significant amount of strain. So at yield, for say grade 300, you're going to have an elongation of about 0.15% from the original length. So it's a very small, very stiff, and that's one of the great advantages of steel um, and why that material is so useful because it has that high stiffness. Um, and then you'll see all the way out at the ultimate strains, uh, you know, for grade 300, it's up around 22% uh, elongation. Grade 350 is about 20% uh, elongation. So that means if you had a, you know, if you're just pulling a, a, a single bar, it would go from, say, 100 millimeters to 120 millimeters uh, before it snapped in half. So it's a really significant amount of elongation that you can get out of steel. And the benefit out of this is we use that as uh, a sort of insurance within our design. And so uh, even though we're designing down at the lower ends of the strain, so strains of about 1%, 2%, we know that if the uh, loading is much higher than was originally designed for, uh, we have all of this ability to continue to deform and still maintain strength. And that's what we call ductility. So ductility is... Um, the sort of ultimate strain or ultimate deformation, which you can achieve divided by the yield strain or yield deformation. And you need to be able to maintain strength within that. And that's what one of the great benefits of structural steel is it's very ductile, which makes it really useful for seismic applications. So continuing on on some subtleties of materials uh, for structural steel within New Zealand and Australia is we... Uh, the materials that we have here means that as we go through different thicknesses of plates, we're going to have different yield strengths. Now, our ultimate strength is going to stay the same, so I've highlighted here, uh, you know, a very common steel grade for, you know, grade 300. And as you can see, as our thickness of the plate goes from uh, 11 millimeters to 17 millimeters, we go from 320 MPA yield stress to 280. MPA yield stress. So, you know, why is this? And it really comes down to the manufacture of it. So as the material gets thinner, it goes through more and more rolling in the steel mill. And the more rolling you have, the smaller the grain size of the actual steel material, and that higher grain size will relate into a higher yield stress. Now, some practical concerns are, say we have an eye section. Um, you know, which yield stress do we use when we design the eye section? So, for example, with the image I have up here, uh, the thickness of the web, T of W, is not necessarily the same as the thickness of the flange, TF. So, you might have two different thicknesses of uh, material, so you're going to have two different yield stresses. So, how do we decide uh, which one to use? Now, it really depends upon what the action is on that section. So for tension and compression, so if we have an axial um, load, well, we can conservatively just use the yield stress of the flanges. And that's because for an I section, uh, the flanges are going to be the um, thickest part because they're going to be uh, optimized for bending about the strong axis. And so that's going to give us a lower yield stress and be a conservative design. Um, alternatively, we can do a weighted average, so we can take, uh, you know, the area of the flanges multiplied by its yield stress uh, and the area of the web multiplied by its yield stress and then take a, a weighted average if we need to be a, a bit more uh, sort of on the mark and, and really need to try to be aggressive with the design. So that's for axial, so tension and compression. Uh, in bending, um, because as I said, these sections are optimized for bending, uh, so they're going to have thicker flanges. Uh, the FY of the flanges is what we're going to use uh, for our design yield stress uh, when we're doing bending. Um, if we're looking at shear, uh, 
uh, and it's shear about the major axis. So the major axis is parallel uh, to the web. Uh, we're going to use the Fy of the web because that's where most of the force is being carried. And then if we have shear about the minor axis, well, again, the, uh, uh, the webs are going to take most of that shear because they're parallel uh, to that action. And so we'll use the yield stress of uh, the web, of the flanges, sorry. And so it, as you can see, uh, it should be fairly intuitive what we need to understand in terms of, uh, you know, what thickness is going to control our yield stress. It comes really down to where, uh, what portion of the section is going to see the load for a given uh, design um, calculation which we're going through. So the final thing which I wanted to cover in uh, this video was going to be around residual stresses. And again, this is a material property uh, which is uh, sort of a result to the uh, manufacture or production of steel sections. So what I have up here are two sections, basically cross sections, and we have um, what's sort of a stress distribution of these two uh, you know, different um, I sections. So in the blue will be residual uh, compression stresses, and in the red will be residual tension stresses, and I have that uh, backwards there in the legend, so I apologize for that. And uh, what that means is, you know, because when steel is made, it's made uh, molten hot. So we can either weld it, and when we weld, we're going to uh, make the parent metal molten and fuse that together. And then as that cools, well, as things cool, they contract, and as they contract, they're going to pull. And so that means that when we weld up an I section, um, we can generate you know, residual stresses and tension, which are up to yield of the, uh, of the material. So very, very high residual stresses. Now for a rolled section, so these would be your UBs or your UCs, um, we might have uh, compression stresses in the web, which are up to about half of yield. And, you know, maybe about um, a quarter of yield uh, to a third of yield within the flanges. Now, there's really nothing we can do about that other than account for that in design. And where we do account for that in design is really down to the section capacity. And as you'll see in the uh, subsequent videos on design, particularly of um, you know, our bending section capacity and our compression section capacity, uh, these residual stresses need to be accounted for in um, really the resistance of the section to buckling. So if we already have additional compression stresses locked in from its manufacturer, uh, that means they're not going to be able to take the uh, sort of ultimate or the theoretical compression stresses uh, that just, you know, a normal plate would um, from just sort of uh, plate buckling theory. So that's sort of wrapping up um, this video, and I just wanted to just do a quick in review. So we looked at stress strain behavior and the importance of ductility on structural members, uh, particularly for structural steel. And uh, one of the other big highlights that we had out of uh, sort of the stress strain behavior is that for New Zealand steels, different material thicknesses are going to have different yield stresses, um, where the thinner the material, the higher the yield stress. And then finally, with residual stresses, as I you know, we just mentioned, they come from the fabrication. And what they're going to do is effectively reduce down the section capacity. And those are accounted for when we go through our design equations for our compression and our bending section capacities. So with that, thank you so much for watching.